Hi, it's Matthew here, and we're going to be looking at question 8, which is a 50 mark question. So, part A tells us that Jessica is making a solution of acid. She has two different bottles. Bottle A has concentration 12%, and bottle B has concentration 5% of the acid. So, we're given an example, which is that for every 100 milliliter of liquid in bottle A, 12 milliliters of that is acid. So, in other words, 12% of the 100 milliliters is acid. That's going to help us with A part 1. And A part 1 wants us to work out how many milliliters of acid are in 200 milliliters of liquid from bottle A. So we know from up here, the concentration of acid in bottle A is 12% of the total amount of liquid in bottle A. We've already been told in the example as well that for every 100 milliliters of liquid in A, there's 12 milliliters of acid. So we have two ways to do this. We know that for every 100 milliliters, there's 12 milliliters of acid. So in 200 milliliters, we could just multiply 12 by 2. That's the simple way to do it. I'm going to show you a different way, just in case you're not given that example, because not every year you'll be given an example like that to help you. So we know that there's 200 milliliters in bottle A, and we're told that the concentration is 12%. So that means we can multiply that by 12% to work out how many milliliters of acid is in the bottle. So we can multiply 200 by 12%, so just type in 12, and then you're clicking shift up here at the top, and then see the answer button has a percentage sign in yellow above it, click that, but make sure you've already clicked shift, and that will give you the percentage sign. So now you have 200 by 12%, and that's equal to 24. So that means there's 24 milliliters of acid in 200 milliliters of liquid from bottle A, now, that's the same thing as multiplying 12 by 2, as we were told in the example, in 100 milliliters of liquid in A, there's 12 milliliters of acid in the bottle. So, whichever way you do it, you'll get full marks, but of course, you're not always given the example, which is why I wanted to show it mathematically like that. Now, let's have a look at A part 2, and here we're told that Jessica mixes 200 milliliters of liquid from bottle A with 300 milliliters from bottle B. And now we have to work out the overall concentration of the acid in the mixture. So that means that the overall, so that's with bottle A and bottle B mixed together. What's the overall concentration of acid? So the first thing to do is work out how many milliliters of acid would be in the liquid from bottle A. And also how many milliliters of acid would be in the liquid from bottle B. So bottle A has 200 milliliters. And it's a 12% concentration, as we were told at the start. So we can multiply that by 12%. Now, we've already worked this out from part one, so we don't really need to work it out again on the calculator. So we can just use our answer from A part one, which was 24 milliliters. And now we'll do the same for bottle B. So in bottle B, we're taking 300 milliliters of liquid from that. Now let's have a look to see what the concentration of acid is in bottle B. So in bottle B, the concentration is only 5%, so it's a lot less than bottle A. So now, rather than multiplying by 12%, we're going to multiply by 5%. And we're going to do the same thing as before. So 300 multiplied by 5%. So again, it's shift. And then the answer button with the percentage sign in yellow above it. And now this time it's 15 milliliters of acid. So now we've worked out that there's 24 milliliters of acid from bottle A and 15 milliliters of acid from bottle B. So now we have to work out what the overall concentration of acid is when you mix both of these bottles together. So the first thing to do is work out what the total milliliters of liquid will be with both bottles mixed together. So I'm going to add together the 200 milliliters from bottle A and the 300 milliliters from bottle B. So 200 plus 300 is 500 milliliters. So 500 milliliters in total when you mix both bottles together. And now let's work out how much acid is there in total when you uh, mix both bottles together. So at this time it's 24 plus 15, as there's 24 milliliters from bottle A and 15 milliliters of acid from bottle B. And 24 plus 15 is 39 milliliters. So we've worked out that there's 39 milliliters of acid when you mix bottle A with bottle B. And the total amount of liquid when you mix both bottles together is 500 milliliters. So that means out of the total 500 milliliters of liquid, 39 milliliters of those is acid, I should say. So we have to work out what percentage of 500 is 39. So to work out what percent a number is of another number, you put the first number over the second number. So we want to work out what percent is 39 of 500. So that means we'll be putting 39 over 500. And to work out the percentage, then you multiply it by 100. Now, you must put 39 on top of the fraction 
because you're trying to get what percent is 39 of 500. If you wanted to get what percent of 500 is 39, then you do the, the other way around, but of course we're not trying to do that. So let's just keep it nice and simple, and it's 39 over 500 multiplied by 100, and we can pop this into the calculator to see what we get. So we get 39 over 5. Now we don't want it as a fraction, so we're going to click this S to D button here, and that will give it to me as a decimal, so it's 7.8%. So that means when you mix 200 milliliters of liquid from bottle A with 300 milliliters of liquid from bottle B, 7.8% of the total amount will be acid. So 7.8% of the 500 is acid. Now let's have a look at a part three. So this wants us to explain why Jessica could not make a solution with a 4% concentration of acid by mixing both bottles together. So remember now bottle A has concentration 12% as we were told at the start. And bottle B has concentration 5%. So this means when you mix both of them together, your overall concentration should be between 5 and 12%. So when you mix both bottles together, your overall concentration has to be between 5% and 12% as bottle A has concentration 12% and bottle B has concentration 5%. So you can never get a concentration outside of that range 5% to 12%. So that's A part 3 done and that was worth 5 marks. A part 2 was worth 10 marks and also A part 1 was worth 5 marks. Now let's go down and have a look at A part 4. So this time it tells us that Jessica makes a mistake in measuring when she mixes another mixture. She wants to measure 250 milliliters but she accidentally measures out 260 instead. So we're asked to work out the percentage error. Now we have a formula for percentage error. It isn't in the formula book, so I recommend you write this down and learn it if you don't know it. And the formula is, so it's the error over the correct amount multiplied by 100. So first of all, we have to work out what the error is. So she measured out 260 when she meant to measure out 250. So to find out the error, it's just the difference between the two. So we take away 250 from 260 and 260 minus 250 is simply 10. So that means she was 10 milliliters off what the correct amount should have been. So it, the error is 10 and the correct amount is the 250 up here because that's what she actually wanted to measure out. She didn't, but that's what she wanted to. So we're going to put 10 over 250 and we multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So we can do 10 over 250 multiplied by 100. And that gives us a simple answer of 4, which means her percentage error is 4%. And that's our answer for A part 4, which was worth 5 marks. So now let's have a look at part B, where we're told that the following identity is often true when a solid is made up of faces with straight edges, and that's C, the number of corners, minus E, the number of edges, plus F, the number of faces, and that should be equal to 2. So B says that the following identity is often true if a solid is made up of faces that has straight edges, and it's C, which is the number of corners, minus E, the number of edges, plus F, the number of faces, equals 2. So B part 1 wants us to write down the values of C, E, and F for a cube. E has already been written in, so we have to remember that C minus E plus F should equal 2. So we have two ways to do this. We can either just count the number of corners and count the number of faces, but if we wanted to just count one of these things, we could count either the corners or the faces, put it into this formula up here, and then see what value for the other one will make it equal to 2. However, I'm just going to count both here and then make sure that the identity works. So first of all, we'll start with the corners. So there's a picture of a cube there, and I'm going to count the corners now. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4 up here, and there's 1, 2, three down there and there's also going to be a fourth down here at the back because remember the cube must go down as well like that at the back that we can't see so that means that there is four on top and four on the bottom so that's eight corners in total so now we have to count the number of faces so you should know by now that a cube has six faces okay so it has six sides to a cube just think of a dice it always has six sides and a dice is in the shape of a cube so you can count them if you want but you should get six faces so we have eight corners 12 edges and 6 faces. Now let's see if the identity holds. So 8 
minus 12, plus 6. We have to see if that equals 2. So 8 minus 12 is minus 4. So then we get minus 4 plus 6 is equal to 2. And minus 4 plus 6 is equal to 2. So we get 2 is equal to 2. The identity holds. So that's the answer for B part 1. C is 8 and F is 6. And that was worth 5 marks. Now let's have a look at B part 2. So B part 2 tells us that the faces of a different solid are all in the shape of a triangle with area 5 centimeters squared. So it has 12 corners, 30 edges, and the identity C minus E plus F is equal to 2 still holds for this solid. So I know that C is 12 and E is 30. So now we have to work out what F is. Once we find the number of faces, we know that each face has an area of 5 centimeters squared. So we can just multiply the number of faces by 5 centimeters squared. And that will give us the total surface area of this solid in centimeters squared. So it's C minus E, which is 12 minus 30 plus F. And we're told that that is equal to 2 by the identity up there. So C minus E, 12 minus 30 is going to give us minus 18. So then I get minus 18 plus F is equal to 2. Now, I just want to have F equal to some answer. So I'm going to move the minus 18 over to the other side. To do that, I'm going to plus 18 onto the other side and plus 18 onto this side because minus 18 plus 18 just leaves me with 0. So then I get F is equal to 2 plus 18, which is 20. So then I get that there's 20 faces in this solid. So if there's 20 faces with area 5 centimeters squared each, I can just multiply 20 by 5 to get the total surface area. And 20 by 5 is 100. So that means the total surface area of this solid is 100 centimeters squared. And that's my answer for B part 2, which is worth 10 marks. So now let's have a look at the final part of the question, B part 3. And we're told that the surface of a third solid is made up of hexagons and pentagons. So hexagons are represented by H and pentagons by P. For this solid, we're given the following equation. And we're asked to work out the number of pentagons, in other words, the value of P. So let's write out the equation down here again. So now, as you'll notice, we have two fractions in this equation. And whenever we want to solve an equation for a variable, so in this case, we're trying to solve for P, you want to get rid of the fractions. When you have one fraction, you just multiply by the denominator, that is the number on the bottom of the fraction. However, when you have two, you want to get the lowest common denominator of both fractions and multiply everything by that. Now, you might remember what the lowest common denominator is, but just in case, I'm going to go through it anyways. So the lowest common denominator is the smallest number that 3 and 2 both go into. So the lowest common denominator of 3 and 2 is the number that both 3 and 2 go into, and it's the smallest number that they both go into. So they obviously go into a lot of numbers, both of them, but we want to get the smallest number that both 3 and 2 go into. So first of all, I'm going to get the multiples of 3. And the multiples of 3 are all the numbers that 3 goes into. Now I'm just going to get the first 6 or 7 of them. So obviously you start with 3, 3 goes into 3, goes into 6, goes into 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, and so on. So you can keep going as much as you want, but I'm going to stop after 7. If we can't find a lowest common denominator after finding 7 multiples of 3, We'll just keep going until we find a number that both 3 and 2 go into, but I think 7 should be enough. So, uh, 7 terms should be enough. So now I'm going to do the same thing for multiples of 2. So this time it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and so on. So now we have to find the smallest number that is both a multiple of 3 and a multiple of 2. And we can clearly see that 6 is in both. And there's no number smaller than 6 in both. So we're going to be multiplying every single term in the equation by 6. So that means both fractions, the H, P, and also the 2 on the right-hand side. So let's do that now. So LCD, lowest common denominator. So this by 6. So everything can be multiplied by 6 now. So multiplying the first fraction by 6, I can divide 3 into 6 to make it a bit easier. So 3 goes into 3 once, and 3 goes into 6 twice. So that leaves me with 2 by 6h plus 5p. Now something similar with the second fraction. 2 goes into 2 once, but it goes into 6 three times. So that means we're left with minus 3 by 6h plus 5p. And now simply 6 by h is just 6h, and 6 by p is 6p, and 6 by 2 is 12. Now multiplying out the brackets, let's see what we get. So 2 by 6h plus 5p, so 2 by 6h is 12h. 
2 by 5p is 10p, minus 3 by 6h is minus 18h, and minus 3 by 5p is minus 15p. The 6h and 6p and the 12 all stay the same. So now I want to add all the like terms together. And the like terms are simply terms that have the same variable beside them. So for example, 12h minus 18h and 6h are all like terms as they all have a h with them. And then the other set of like terms here is 10p minus 15p and plus 6p. So now I'm just going to rearrange this so that all the h's are together and all the p's are together. So now I've just rearranged the equation. It's the exact same equation, except now all the h's are beside each other and all the p's are also beside each other. And now we can add all the h's together and all the p's together. So 12h minus 18h plus 6h. So in other words, 12 minus 18 plus 6. And you can work that out. It actually is 0. So as that's 0, we can just leave it out. Okay, it's not going to make any difference to the equation as 12 minus 18 is minus 6. And minus 6 plus 6 is 0. You can do that on the calculator if you're not sure about that, but it will give you 0. You can write down 0h if you want, but 0h is still just going to be 0, as anything by 0 is 0. So then we're left with 10p minus 15p plus 6p is equal to 12. So 10p minus 15p is minus 5p. And then we get minus 5p plus 6p is equal to 12. And minus 5 plus 6 is 1. So that's going to give us 1p is equal to 12. In other words, P is equal to 12. So there are 12 pentagons in the surface of this solid. That's our answer for B part 3, which is worth 10 marks. And that's the final part of the question and the end of this video. Thank you very much for watching and I hope I helped.